it's a real treat to be uh, hosting Ken, who's uh, covered the, the media world for The New Yorker for many years and uh, has been ranked as a, America's top media critic. Uh, he started in journalism nearly 50 years ago, first as a political correspondent for the New York Post, then a staff writer and weekly, weekly columnist for the Village Voice, and a contributing editor at New York Magazine. For a decade and a half, from the late 1970s to the uh, early 90s, uh, he wrote a weekly political column for the New York Daily News, and he also, during that period, started writing for the New Yorker. Then in 1992, he began doing the Annals of Communications profiles uh, for the magazine. Uh, over, over the years, Ken has profiled many of the leading figures of the information age, and he's reported on many important developments in the media business. He's also authored a dozen previous books, ranging in uh, subjects from uh, network television to the ad business, from Microsoft to Google. And five of those works uh, reached the national bestseller list. In Hollywood ending, uh, Ken chronicles Harvey Weinstein's uh, volatile and, and tragic career from his rise to becoming one of Hollywood's biggest power brokers uh, the pioneering producer and distributed, distributor of many great movies, uh, to his highly publicized fall after scores of women came forward with their stories of sexual abuse by Weinstein. Uh, in a watershed trial two years ago, Weinstein was convicted of third-degree rape and another sex felony in New York and sentenced to 23 years in prison. He's awaiting a trial on f further charges uh, in, in California. Ken profiled Weinstein in The New Yorker 20 years ago and, and portrayed him then as, as bullying, even violent at times, towards employees and, and collaborators. Uh, but he was unable at that time to confirm the darker rumors of Weinstein's behavior as a, as a sexual predator. Uh, that truth finally emerged in 2017 in stories by Jody Kanner and Megan uh, Tui in The New York Times and by Ronan Farrow uh, in, in The New Yorker. Now, uh, revisiting the Weinstein saga, uh, Ken has produced a comprehensive biography that adds uh, more revealing detail and insightful context. He, he examines the raging impulses and unquenchable need to dominate that warped Weinstein's actions. He explores the culture of silence that allowed such monstrousness to go unchecked for so long. And he looks at how much of Weinstein's tale is also a larger story about uh, Hollywood and, uh, and about power. Uh, so I think we're in for a very informed and interesting discussion this evening. Please join me in welcoming Ken Arletta. Thank you. I thought I'd begin uh, by picking up something Bradley said. I didn't know Harvey Weinstein very well in 2002 when I agreed to profile him for The New Yorker. Um, and I spent probably four months doing that profile. And we spent many hours together, including about 12 hours of taped interviews, some of which I use in the book. And at one point, I, people I talked to all would say, who work for him or in Hollywood, we know Harvey cheats on his wife. But very few people said they knew he was a rapist. And so that was not out there uh, the way we now assume it was. But I heard from a woman producer of an incident that took place at the Venice Film Festival in 1998 with two women, one named Rowena Chu, the other Zelda Perkins. They were his London assistants. And suppose that the story was that Harvey attempted to rape Rowena, and that Zelda led the fight to get him to prosecute him, to, to bring it to the police. No one had ever, in all the previous years, had ever brought Harvey to trial or to ever threaten him, and nor had he signed, which he did later on, many non-disclosure agreements. What happened was they threatened him, and he got nervous. He flew over to London with his business affairs person, Steve Utensky, who was, who was an enabler. If you read the non-disclosure agreement, it's quite obvious that he was 
he knew what was going on. And um, in any case, Harvey suppressed them from speaking out, got them to sign non-disclosure agreements. I went to the courts in London and the courts in New York, and I said, why can't I find any evidence of criminal trial evidence or file, filings, lawsuits, et cetera, about this case? And then I learned why. And the answer was that what Harvey would do when someone brought a claim against him privately, usually, he would say, he would have his lawyer meet them and say, here's X number of dollars. In this case, it was almost $500,000, 250 each. And in return, you have to sign this non-disclosure agreement. The non-disclosure agreement means you can't tell anyone. You can't tell your parents, you can't tell your, your husband, you can't tell your psychiatrist. And if you break the non-disclosure agreement, you've got to give the money back and I'm going to sue you, so it's going to be more expensive. So I, I had that information, but I couldn't get either woman to speak to me. And my source, who I tell in, in the book was Donna Gigliotti, who was an Academy Award winning producer, she refused to speak unless the women would speak, and they wouldn't. Um, but I, I said, if I could figure out some way of showing that Disney, the corporate parent of Miramax, or Miramax, his company, paid for the non-disclosure agreement. Someone's going to jail. I've got my story. I don't need the woman to talk to me. So I confront Harvey in a small conference room, and there ensued one of the most amazing experiences I've ever had as a journalist. I said, Harvey, tell me about Rowena Chu and Zelda Perkins. He says, what do you want to know? I said, I want to know, did you attempt to rape Rowena Chu? Actually, at the time, I was told he had actually raped her, which was inaccurate. If I had published it, it would have been false. He, didn't, he, he attempted to rape her. She escaped. And he stood up. He got up from his small conference table, about a table the size. He was on the end there, close to where Bradley would be. And I was here. And he came over here and stood above me. And he clenched his fists, and his lip trembled. And he said, if you publish that, it, it will destroy the lives of my three teenage daughters. It will destroy my marriage. You can't do that. So at that point, I said, I'm not going to sit down and let this guy take a poke at me. I'm going to stand up and, and face him face to face. As soon as I did, this was the amazing thing, Harvey started to cry. And I don't mean, I don't mean small tears rolling down his cheek. I mean, he was sobbing out of control sobbing, and, which was extraordinary because he was really afraid that this was going to finally expose him. No one had ever exposed him before. But I couldn't expose him because I didn't have any woman on the record, and the New Yorker is not the National Enquirer. We can't publish rumors. <laughs> and so next, but I kept in mind Harvey and, and knew he was a predator. And in 2015, when the Italian model this is the first time it was ever public, it was in the press, that Harvey abused women. Literally. He'd been doing it for four decades. It never got in the press until then. She, the police wired her. She had a tape of Harvey acknowledging he grabbed her breasts. And, but then the DA, thinking she, was, she might not be a credible witness, because there were questions about, about her, decided not to file charges. And she then got a million dollar non-disclosure agreement and, and changed her testimony, basically exonerating Harvey. But she did something really clever. She kept the tape. And she would give that tape to Ronan Farrow two years later. But before I get to Ronan Farrow and the Times reporters, I said, with, I believe this one was accurate. I talked to a lawyer. I believe she was telling the truth the first time, the Italian model. But I, I saw in Variety that Ashley Judd claimed that some studio executive asked her for a massage. That was Harvey's M.O. He, he, he didn't have, he was not Don Juan. He would say, I got a kink in my neck, could you give me a, can you give me a, a rub down? And <clears> the <throat> second person was Angelina Jolie. I heard in her first movie, which she did for Miramax, that he had tried to assault her. And the third was a woman, an aspiring actress, who wrote a column for the New York Observer, who I did talk to. Jolie wouldn't talk. Ashley Judd wouldn't talk. This woman, who 
claimed that Harvey had described in great detail in her columns anonymously, didn't name him, she would not go on the record. So I didn't have the story. Switched to 2015, two years later. Ronan Farrow calls me up. I didn't know Ronan Farrow. And the only, all I knew about him was the Woody Allen stuff. And as a journalist, I had a question in my mind, is he a zealot or is he a journalist? Is he trying to square things up in some way? He called me up and he, after talking to me and I pumped him for information where he was on the Harvey thing, I was confident that he really was careful. Judicious was the word I would later use. But he said, can I have access to your papers at the New York Public Library? So I gave him access to them, which is my tapes and, and my notebooks, et cetera. And, but, but anything off the record, he couldn't use. The, the women I mentioned, he could, and Donna Gigliotti, he was, that was off the record. He said, he called me up, can I interview you? I said, I'm finishing a book, you'll have to come out to Bridgehampton, where I was writing at the time. He comes out, and we spend about four hours together. And I said, so what do you got? He said, I have three women on camera who, who acknowledged that Harvey attempted or did rape them. I have five women on camera but shielded, their names are not disclosed, who say the same thing. And I have the audio tape of the Italian model. I said, great, you broke the case. He said, I said, what's the next step? He says, I meet with the president of NBC News, Noah Oppenheim, on August 8th. Great. August 9th, I call Ronan Farrow. And I said, so how'd you do? He says, can I call you on a secure line? Which immediately I'm saying, what is that all about? And little, what we later learned is that he was being tailed and, and his phone was being tapped. So he calls, he calls me and he says, NBC has basically fired him. They're not running the story. They don't think he has the goods. And, uh, but he's free to take it anywhere. He said, who would want it? You know, he didn't ask us a question. He asked it as a defeated statement. I said, give me your number. Let me call you back. And I didn't tell him why. I called David Remnick, the editor of The New Yorker, who's a friend and, and a, a lion in the world of journalism. And I said, David, this kid finally has broken the case. It's unbelievable. And he's judicious. He's careful. He says, have him call me on Monday morning. Ronan did, and Ronan went off. I had nothing to do with it at the time. I had one initial meeting with him and Remnick, but essentially it was all Ronan. NBC then claimed that Ronan didn't have the goods. He only had the goods after he went to The New Yorker, which is just baloney. He had the goods at, at that time. In any case, two sets of reporters do an amazing job. They got women comfortable enough to talk. I'm talking about Jody Cantor and Meg Toohey at The Times, who broke the story in early October, and a week later, Ronan Farrow, who broke the story in, in The New Yorker. And what they did successfully they realized that you got to get the woman not alone to talk but talk with fellow victims so they would feel comfortable but the feat of getting women who were really assaulted and afraid to come out and and speak against Harvey Weinstein is an extraordinary feat there are people who say well you had the Cosby case and the Ailes case and the culture was changing changing well it did in some ways but that we should not minimize what these three reporters did. It's extraordinary. Anyway, I then say, how do I come to write a book? I say, what they did, what Ronan and Meg and, and, and Jody did, was they were looking at Harvey from the outside. I said, can I write a book going in the inside, looking out from Harvey, being inside his head, his body? And, and what he went through and, and experienced and his whole career. So I said, one question I wanted to address was what made Harvey the monster he became? And in reporting, I found some interesting things. I found, for instance, that in Flushing, Queens, where he grew up, his mother, Miriam, was a very volatile personality, not unlike Harvey as an adult, yelling all the time. Yelling so much that his friends, who I interviewed, they played poker on the weekends at different homes. They would not play at Miriam Weinstein's home because they were too uncomfortable. They said she yells too much. Harvey, you're fat. Harvey, don't do this. Harvey, this. But. So if you look at Harvey's throughout Miramax and the Weinstein Company, he was basically, his mother had normalized yelling. And that's what he, that's what he was doing in the office. So. 
I also learned in, in probing his early years, Harvey did not, to my knowledge, uh, and I, I talked to a fair number of people, did not abuse women, girls, in high school or junior high school, nor his first three years at the University of Buffalo. He only started to abuse women when he had power. And he had power when he dropped out of the University of Buffalo after his junior year. He started Harvey and Corky Presents, a rock promotion company that was wildly successful. They got Sinatra, they got the Rolling Stones, they got Billy Joan, they got all these top performers, the Eagles, to come and perform in the Buffalo Stadium and, and other places. So he was really a powerful guy. And he had a woman work for him by the name of Hope Damore, who I interviewed, who now lives in San Antonio. I think, and I have her picture in the book, I think Hope was the first woman he raped. She was an assistant to him. But he raped many other women. And the more power he got, the more the raping and the abuse of women escalated throughout his life. So that was one thing I wanted to explore, what made Harvey who he was. And I think one of the things that made him who he was is power. And it, I mean, Bob, his brother Bob wasn't raping women. I mean, so you can't blame Miriam Weinstein for that. I mean, it's just too simple. There's no one single rose, but I also came to feel that Harvey was a sociopath. And, and, and even that, that's conjectural. The second thing I was interested in exploring, as Bradley said in the introduction, is how did this guy get away with this for four decades without anyone blowing the whistle on him? And it was, it was Hollywood. It was the people who worked for him. It was, it was reporters who, who got the benefit of his tips and, and come to my screening, or got book contracts from talk books, which he started. And you know, it was quite extraordinary, the, his use of power to keep the secret. And when people say to me, we knew he cheated on his wife, we didn't know he, he raped women. Let me tell you a story. I interviewed a woman by the name of Hillary Silver, who was an agent who was gonna move back to New York with a boyfriend, very attractive young woman. And she came up for a job interview at Miramax in Tribeca. And she gets on the elevator, and who's on the elevator with her? Harvey Weinstein. And Harvey looks her up and down. And he says, what are you doing here? She says, I'm, I have an interview with Human Resource. He says, come and see me when you're done. So Hillary goes to Human Resources, has the interview, and the Human Resources head walks her back to Harvey's office. They walk in together. The first thing Harvey says, he points his finger, he says, you're hired. He didn't consult with the Human Resources. I mean, he hired her because she was, she was a beauty. And so she had to go off on a trip to Europe uh, vacation. And she was coming back in three or four weeks. And the night, the day before she used to start work, four executives at Miramac reach out to her and say, we'd love to take you for a drink. And she said, this is so wonderful. What a great place this is. What a great culture. People are welcoming me, et cetera, et cetera. Well, they didn't welcome her. What they said to her over drinks was, Hillary, you don't want to come to work here. You're an attractive woman. He will assault you, I promise you. And she didn't go to work. She basically didn't take the job. So if that level of people at Miramax knew, how many others knew or should have known that he was doing it? The agents who sent their actresses up to hotel suites and the, and the ac young actresses came back. In some cases, they didn't come back. In some cases, they were doing, they were career advancement for them. But m many came back wounded, hurt, abused by this monster. And they tell their agents, that, what did the agents do? Nothing. CAA issued a statement at one point in, after Harvey was exposed in, in the fall of 2017 saying we should have done more, the, the top agency there. So I was interested in, in, in the culture of silence and, and try in the book to identify how that happened and who some of the culprits were. And I covered the trial every day. And one of the great things about covering the trial, you get a treasure trove of all these emails that are submitted as evidence that are, there are too many, there's a blizzard of these emails. But if you go up to the office at the end of the day and read these emails, it's, there, many of them were so incriminating to the people who covered up for Harvey. It was extraordinary. 
The third thing I was interested in, I mentioned briefly, power. How did Harvey, who had amazing power at one point, he, was, he published a magazine, he published talk books, he, he, he was making movies that a serious actor or director wanted to be in, unlike the studio with the sequel movies they were making. So he was a, he was a magnet in Hollywood. And when, he, when Disney acquired him in, in 1993, they gave him money to actually produce movies, not, to, not just distribute them. And he was producing more movies than any studio, Miramax was. So he was really a power. And at one point, when he took a reporter for The Observer down in a headlock outside and screamed, and we know he did this because the reporter had his tape recorder going, I'm the effing sheriff of this effing town, and don't you forget it. Harvey felt that he was this power, powerful figure. So I was interested in exploring how he used power, giving money to Obama and the Clintons and Governor Pataki, the Republican governor of New York, and Michael Bloomberg, the Republican and independent, then independent mayor. So he was basically parceling out money to people, as well as parceling out roles. The other thing that interested me was the relationship between the brothers. And, and Harvey and Bob started this business together. They were equal partners. Bob, in many ways, was more successful than Harvey. His scary movies, some of those horror movies he made, made more money their Miramax movies did. But they were partners and they worked together. And they were very close. And if you worked for Miramax, you knew you had a, the only decision makers were the two brothers. Yet by 2015, Bob is complaining incessantly to Harvey. Harvey, you're spending like a bandit. This is crazy. And when, when he was divorced from Disney, Disney basically chased him out in 2005, saying he's too difficult to work with. And, and he was. And he starts the Weinstein Company. He got a billion dollars of seed investment money. He lost all of it. All of it. Harvey was a terrible businessman. And, and his movies were not as successful as they were in, in, in the 90s and the early 2000s. So Bob would complain, Harvey, stop spending money. Stop picking up tabs for people. Stop flying on private planes all the time. Stop buying your wife, his new wife's, gowns, Marchese gowns, for the, the a Shah or some Middle East potentate who he wanted to get to invest money in. And then one day, they're in a meeting in 2015, and Harvey sucker punches his brother and breaks his nose, and blood is flowing all over. And everyone said, my God, what, what is going on? This is really awful. In, on June 2nd, 2015, the several members of the board uh, meet with Harvey on the phone. And I have a tape of this, which I, I transcribe and share the transcription in the, off, in the uh, book. Harvey starts screaming at the board members, I want you to fire my brother. This is 2015. Harvey, we can't fire your brother. You, you have to do it. You're the CEO of this company. We're just board members. You should fire him. He's losing all this money. He wasn't losing the money. Harvey was losing the money. Any case, I was able to get Bob Weinstein to cooperate with me and tell his story. And we probably did 20, 25 interviews. It was very hard to get him to talk, and it took a while. But eventually, he, he did, and he was candid with me. And one of the things you learn is that after Harvey was exposed in October of 2017, he couldn't be fired unless the board voted him off, but the board was his board. They were rubber stamps. But he could be fired if a couple of anti-Harvey board members joined with Bob, who, like Harvey, had weighted voting shares. And Bob used those weighted voting shares to fire his brother. And then he met with his brother, and he said, Harvey, I think you know, you're a sex addict, and I think you should go to this place in, in Arizona and get help. And and Harvey went there, follow, listened to his brother. He went there, but he didn't seek help. He didn't stay in the dormitory where the other patients went. This is a place where Rush, Rush Limbaugh went and, and several other famous Tiger Woods went there. And, and he spent all his time on his cell phone hanging out at a diner. He didn't do it. And Bob 
from that point on stopped talking to his brother and hasn't talked to him since, from 2017 to today. So Harvey then, into early 18, is in danger of getting indicted. He needs a criminal lawyer. And I want to end with this story because it, it, it I think, encapsulates something fundamental about Harvey. He meets with Ben Braffman, who arguably is the best criminal attorney in New York City. And they meet at the Lambs Club, and Braffman is sitting in a, in a banquet looking, and he sees this guy who he'd never met walk in with a huge, his huge stomach, but he had on a, a beautiful, Ben said, beautiful linen, crisp linen shirt worn out, not tucked in. And he comes over and sits down. He orders a cheeseburger and an extra large portion of french fries. And I'd like a big bowl of ketchup, please. Brofman orders a little Caesar salad. And before Brofman Caesar salad comes, Harvey starts to chopping on, and, and the oil or grease from the hamburger, cheeseburger, is slipping down. But then he reaches, he doesn't use a, a knife and fork, he reaches into the ketchup bowl with a handful of french fries and goes like this and shovels it in his mouth repeatedly. And suddenly there are blood stains, or what looked like blood stains, on his white shirt. And then a French fry, ketchupy French fry, falls down the front of his shirt, the open neck shirt. And Brofman says, and, and Harvey starts to reach in to grab it out. And Brofman says, Harvey, what are you doing? Stop that. Just stand up, but the French fry will fall out. But Harvey couldn't stop because Harvey has impulse control issues. If you gave him a pack of cigarettes, he would rip off the top because he didn't have the patience to open up the flip-top box. Diet Cokes, he had them lined up. He ate just shoveling food in his mouth and talking while he chewed fast. And people were afraid to sit across from him because projectiles would come. But the Harvey who abused women was the same Harvey that Ben Brofman was sitting across in that restaurant. He couldn't control himself. And he couldn't for his temper. He couldn't with his sex drive. He couldn't the way he ate. He has severe diabetes, and yet he always insisted that a, a, a bowl of peanut-covered, chocolate-covered M&M, peanut M&Ms, be in his hotel suite or his office. And he would just, again, with diabetes, he's eating chocolate. So it was quite extraordinary. Anyway, that's the odyssey of, of my experience with this guy. The interesting thing for me was to spend so much time reporting on a monster and yet being able, hopefully being able to step back and describe the movies he made, the talent he had to make those movies without negating the fact that he was a monster. But that was, it was hard because I really don't like the son of a bitch. Anyway, <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm a huge fan of uh, your book on Ted Turner. I read and I loved, and your article in the New Yorker on Mary Cuomo was one of my favorites. So it was great. Two great people. So before I talk about Harvey Weinstein, yeah, I love Mary Cuomo. This was common knowledge that he was. I mean, he was. He would berate people in public. He was. You know, they commented on his behavior at the Oscars. How did it take so long to, for people to finally say enough? I mean, he was abusive to his assistants. I, I just don't understand it. <laughs> well, you know. Look at this town today. Look at Republicans. They know that Donald Trump is lying about winning the election. He didn't win the election. You know, he lost by 7 million votes. They know that, but they're afraid to say anything. So fear is they don't want Trump to come out against them. They'll lose a the primary, they fear. So fear of Harvey is, is similar to the fear we see here. A second, a second reason. No one wants to, uh, is conformity. No one wants to be a rat. They don't want to, you know, they, they want to conform, keep low profile, not get on the bad side of people, or think that people will think ill of you because you're a rat. And the third reason, I think, is lack of character. I mean, the people who should have blown the whistle on Harvey have a character deficiency, in my judgment, those who knew. Who, who, who knew before? I mean, obviously, did his brother know? <clears throat> his brother, who I confronted with that question, said, I knew my brother was a, 
was a sexual. I, I knew he, he, he. The phrase he used was a um, um, couldn't control his sex urge, but he, he actually used another phrase for it. I'll think of it in a minute. He said, "But I didn't know he was raping women." And the brother, actually, in the case of the two women I mentioned from the Venice Film Festival, right. the five hundred thousand dollars. I I asked. I said, "Harvey, I need to see how you paid for it." Thinking again that I would get that if Disney paid or Miramax paid, I have my story and, and someone's going to jail. And he, the next, he, Harvey protested. I said, I need to see it tomorrow. And he slid across the table two canceled checks from Bob's personal. And Bob said to me, I said, you, you paid for non-disclosure? He said, yeah, because Harvey said he was being blackmailed by these women. And do I know he knew? He says he didn't know. What, right. I don't know what else I can do, but ask the uncomfortable questions, which is what I did. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, sir. I'm about the same age as Harvey Weinstein. 70. And I, I'm from Buffalo. I was in college at the same time he was in college in Buffalo at a different school. Um, but the fact that this change into a monster or the start of him becoming a monster happened in my hometown interests me. Do you know why? No. Why there? It, was, it, was it partly being away from his home? No, I think it was power. He, for the first time in his life, Harvey had real power. And because I mean, of the concert series that yeah, he was putting he, on? They were, they were really a big concert yeah, promotion I remember. group. Yeah. And Harvey and Corky, people know by their first name, and, and they were having all these acts, and he put police to do security at night, mm -hmm. and he was a big advertiser in the press for the concerts they were doing. So there was a concerted community of people who were very much in his corner. But he, he I, I think it's power. I think the power went to his head, and he thought he can get away with it. One of the things you, you find when you talk to, when you cover um, people who have large egos, be it a politician or a public figure of some kind, or Harvey Weinstein, or an actor, they're surrounded by young and very beautiful women who are very ambitious. And, and unlike, say, the automobile companies, you don't have in the automobile companies attractive, sexy women working side by side with the CEO or the people. And in Hollywood, you do. And I think one of the things that happened is that a woman would say, oh, Mr. Weinstein, I love your movies. They are so good. How do you do it? And I think he confused a compliment with a come on. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I, I think people like Bill Clinton did the same. Um, and, and I think it's, it's not uncommon to see that happening. And this was already happening when he was in college. Well, it, it, he was out of college. He had dropped out after his junior year. When he got power at Harvey and Corky Presents, yeah. he was doing that for 10 years. Yeah. And they were really successful. Yeah. I think then this, happened. Thank you. I think uh, Hollywood directors are very, very creative people. Did it, and I read the portion of your book that talked about the contest between uh, Shakespeare and Love and Saving Private Ryan. <coughs> Harvey never directed a movie as far as I recall. He did one. He and his brother directed a movie uh, with Alan Brewer, their childhood friend. And, and, and it was a total flop. They wrote the script and they produced it. And it was not unlike, uh, based on Harvey and Corky's experience right. in Buffalo in the music business. But was, was, he, was he jealous of Spielberg's like, creativity and uh, uh, the fact that uh, this, this guy, you know, really made money hand over fist for a while? He, Harvey located Miramax in New York, okay. not Hollywood. He had this attitude that it was us him against them. And he was fighting the Hollywood establishment. He was fighting the movie theaters that didn't want his foreign films to keep his foreign films right. in the movies. So he was, he was basically imbued with a kind of paranoia. He, what he said about Saving Private Ryan was, he, he would say this publicly, though he denied to me and right. others that this, he ever said this, which is, was a lie. He said the first 17 minutes of Saving Private Ryan was brilliant, but then the movie just dissolves into nothingness. 
and that's what that's what he was telling the press and, and the Academy voters and denying he, he did that and Spielberg was so incensed as I describe in the book when Harvey came over to congratulate him at the at the end of the Academy Awards that night which was 89 based on the 88 movies yeah. um, Har Spielberg just ran away and, and wouldn't talk to him I, I always thought that one of the interesting points in like the Me Too movement in Hollywood was when Spielberg's associate Kathleen Kennedy got involved in like raising money for women to meet with lawyers and things <coughs> like that. Do you, do you have any sense that that went on too, that she was an important figure in that effort? I have no sense of her relationship oh. with Harvey or, okay. or role at all. Okay. We have a lot of men asking I questions. I, Where are I, the women? I, I noticed that too. Uh, but how do you know I'm a man? <laughs> uh, thanks for your presentation. Given your contact and communications with Ronan Farrow about a sexual predator, did the subject of Woody Allen come up? And do you have anything to say about Woody Allen? Um, I did not talk to Ronan about Woody Allen. Um, what I did with um, as I mentioned, I was I was skeptical of Ronan initially because I was worried was he a zealot or a reporter, and I watched the HBO documentary, and I thought it was pretty convincing that Woody Allen was was guilty. Um, I I ran into Alec Baldwin. I'm not name dropping, but it was a, a big outdoor thing in the Hamptons last week. And I said that to him, and he had just interviewed Woody Allen on his podcast. And he said, that's false. The district, district, the attorney general of Connecticut, who said he should have prosecuted, he said, was actually having an affair with Mia Farrow. I have no idea. And, and I, I, should, I should not have said that, by the way, because uh, I'm spreading rumors that, that may not be true. In any case, Woody Allen has some supporters. I'm not one. Thank you. Um, you said that you really didn't like him. And what is it like to spend, I, I'm not sure how many years you spent on this, but to get up basically most mornings and have to inhabit this person, especially because you wanted to talk about him from the inside. So it is different from reporting. You did have to kind of get inside his head. And what was that experience like? Did you want to take a shower at the end of the day? I mean, what, what happened? Uh, well, I did take a shower at the end of the day, but I'm, I'm not sure that it was causal. But he, I actually found it, as I suggested, a, a really interesting discipline challenge for me. Um, be, and, and made easier by the fact that his, so many of his movies were so good. And made easier because when you probe people about what was Harvey's talent, you, you learn he really had immense talent. One of the talents he had was that he understood that a key to a successful movie was a good screenplay. It wasn't the actor or the director. You can have a good actor and a good director. If it's a lousy screenplay, he said to me, it's going to flop. So he understood that, and he's a voracious reader. Harvey really reads a lot. Second, he was a brilliant marketing guy. Uh, I mean, you look at what he did, for instance, in The Crying Game. You remember The Crying Game? Early before that movie ends, we learn that, that the ex-prisoner who was killed and, and the IRA guy who meets her, discovers that she is a he. And it opens in England, and the audience knew that, and the movie failed. And Harvey figured out a way to do a survey, pay for a Gallup poll, that showed the public did not want to know the ending. And he called editors, and he said, you cannot destroy your audience's experience by coming out and telling what the ending is. And they didn't. And, and it was a huge success, so much of a success when it came out in 93 that Disney decided that they're going to acquire the Weinstein Company. And they actually bid against Ted Turner to do that uh, and won. So he was, a, he was a brilliant marketing guy. And also, Harvey, and, and you just knew this from talking to him, he really knew a lot about movie history. And, and 
he was not just the suit, which is how people talk, actors and actors who are good talk about people in the studio business. Harvey really knew stuff. And one of the stories I tell is when Ben Affleck and, and uh, Matt Damon did Goodwill Hunting, the script for that, um, the Mike Metavoy turned it down because he said it was too violent and, and, and it, it really wouldn't work. And Harvey read it and loved it, but he met with Affleck and Damon and he said, I don't understand something. He said, it's a really good script, but on page whatever, 170 or 150, whatever, we, we, the Matt Damon character um, has sex with a man and a totally out of character. Where'd that come from? And they said to him, Harvey, we put that in to see whether you read the, read the script. <laughs> and he did. Hi. Hi, Ken. I'm particularly interested in the politicians who took money from Harvey Weinstein. And did you speak with them? And what was your take on whether how much they knew and which of those three, you know, attributes, whether it's lack of character, advancement, or what have you, that motivated them? Well, I know that Hillary was warned by Lena Dunham, the director, that you can't um, be in business. This is the 2016 campaign when she's running for president. You have to reject Harvey Weinstein because he's a rapist. And Hillary's person, who she told that to, his press secretary, her press secretary, she claims she was never told that. Is that true? I don't know. Um, Pataki, Governor Pataki, was one of the people who called Harvey, and um, Harvey, the New York Times, is investigating you. One of the first clues he had that he was being chased by the New York Times came from Governor Pataki, who he'd given several hundred, raised several hundred thousand dollars for. So did I well on talking to politicians, no, but I had access to an amazing array of emails from Pataki and, and et cetera that I, I didn't need to talk to them at that point. Now, I could have talked to them, and maybe I should have talked to them and said, why, you, you were told this, why, why, why'd you do what you did? Why'd you continue to keep in touch with them? And that's a fair criticism, that I, I could have done more on that. Thank you. Uh oh, the boss asked the question. No, we we were we were talking before the event about your efforts to um, to interview Weinstein. I mean, you had all these uh, uh, conversations uh, for your um, original profile, um, but um, but obviously you were interested in uh, in trying to uh, to talk to him for the book. And um, my question is now, you know, you've written other books about other prominent people. You've done so many profiles for the magazine about a number of prominent people. How, how important is it or not when you're doing these profiles or biographies to actually be able to talk to the person you're writing about? Oh, I think it's essential. Um, I, I mean, I once talked to, I won't name the reporter, but a very esteemed reporter. I said, what are you doing next? And this reporter said, I'm doing a, a biography of a very prominent figure. And I said, is the figure cooperating with you? And he says, who the hell cares? <laughs> well, he should have cared. It was a terrible book. And, <laughs> and you know, your job is to get inside that person. I mean, for instance, when I, I'll give you one example of what I mean. One of the things I do all the time is I assume I'm going to do multiple interviews. It's not just one interview. And I'm not looking to play gotcha with the person. I'm trying to understand the person. And I actually say to them, my task is to try and understand you. And so when I covered the Microsoft trial, it, it was called Microsoft 3.0, and which they lost. The, the argument was that they were a monopoly. And Judge Jackson was the judge in that case. And I sat in that courtroom every day, as I did in the Harvey case. And he agreed to let me interview him after the court was over, but before he issued, or maybe after he issued his ruling. No, before he issued his ruling. So I come to his office, 
and we wound up doing 12 hours of interviews, four hours, four hours, and four hours. The first four hours I spent with Judge Jackson, my questions were all, tell me about your childhood, tell me about your father, your mother, tell me about how you became a lawyer, tell me how you went to work for the Nixon re-election campaign in 1972. And as Judge Jackson talked about his experience and his revulsion at Richard Nixon, who he said, I, I, it was one of the worst experiences of my life. This man I revered and I went to work for, and my father had been in government, I really wanted to be in government and a public servant, but he lied. And he lied to everyone who worked for him and he lied to the country, and he was an awful man. And then I thought back to the trial, and in the trial, one of the things that David Boyes, who was the government attorney and, and did a brilliant job, he would, there were 20 hours of taped interviews with Bill Gates, and, and he would often play them on the screen. And what you saw was Nixon. You saw Gates you know, refusing to answer questions, misleading, et cetera. And what I realized was Judge Jackson when he saw Bill Gates, he was seeing Richard Nixon. So that early interview was so revealing of who he was. Look at Harvey. I mean, I, I think learning about his mother is, is incredibly revealing to him. And his, I asked his brother, I said, who was very candid about the mother, I said, Bob, what do you see? Again, these, these are the early questions you ask about biography, which, which become very important. I said, Bob, what do you see of your father in Harvey? And he said to me, I don't see my father, I see my mother. Wow. Mm. So it's, it's, I mean, I find that, that when you ask, when you have an intimate conversation with people about their life, you, you develop an intimacy with them that is, particularly if they don't think you're trying to play gotcha with them, that you're really interested in the questions you're asking them it becomes a, a solidifying thing. And, and I mean, I remember when I interviewed, I, I spent a lot of time doing a profile of Rupert Murdoch, another person who, who actually doesn't talk to me anymore from the, from the <laughs> profile. But we spent enormous amounts of time. And I know from the early conversations about his father who he revered and the early days of Oxford where he was a radical leftist and had a Lenin bust in his dorm room at, at Oxford, Murdoch, to me, I became someone really intimate with him. I mean, Ken knows me. I've shared secrets with him that I haven't shared with people who work for me. And, and I think that happens. And, and it's one of the things that allows you to profile someone, uh, hopefully with some insight. I mean, we also talked uh, briefly about if you could have interviewed Weinstein what would you have asked him? Do you want to well, sh share that? Well, actually, I had worked, uh, I was scheduled, to, at first, I tell the story in the book, but at first, he was getting very nervous about, I'm the only one doing a biography of him. And so he tells his PR guy, he said, I'll talk to Ken. This is from prison. If Ken agrees to ask me any negative questions that come up in the book, claims made against me in the book, that I haven't already answered. Uh, and I went back to his PR guy and I said, I will be happy to do that, but I want the freedom to ask him any questions I want. No, end of, end of negotiations. They come back a week or so later and say, Harvey will agree to do interviews if you don't tape it. I said, deal breaker, I have to tape it. Harvey will agree, then a week later, Harvey will agree to do it if you, if you don't if you have, if he has a translator to, to do the script, you know, I said, no, I have to, I can't rely on you to do that. Uh, at the end, he agreed after about two months of negotiation to my terms. And then his lawyer called me the day before I, we were supposed to do the first of several phone interviews. He doesn't have internet access as a prisoner. And his lawyer said, Mr. Ouellette, I can't allow my client who's gone on trial in LA but one of the, among the questions I wanted to ask Harvey, and, and I did actually ask him, in the, we had an email, finally an email exchange, maybe 25 emails, and one of them I asked him the following question, which of course he didn't answer. 
Harvey, when you put your head on a pillow at night after raping, Je say, Jessica Mann, who was one of the key defendants in the New York trial, how did you explain to yourself what you had just done? Now, he never answered that question. And I suspect if he had answered the question, he would have said something he was always saying. It was consensual. And she wanted something from me, and I wanted something from her. It was a fair trade. Hmm. Now, you really got to be skewed and in the head to think that's a fair trade. But that was him. I mean, Harvey tried to normalize aberrant behavior. He would come into a suite in London, let's say. Zelda described this, and she said, I gave to Rowena when she was succeeding me, I gave her a list of 10, ten do's and don'ts. And one of the do's and don'ts was, when Harvey comes in the suite after dinner and takes off all his clothes and parades around the suite naked, it, it is normal. He won't, you know, this is Harvey. And, and what he did with Rowena, which is what he did with a lot of women, he would say, I got a kink in my neck. Can you give me a massage? I'll give you a massage. And one of the warnings, among the warnings that Zelda had on a piece of paper, which I have, is don't ever give him a, a, a massage. Also a warning, don't let him take a, wear two pairs of pants. So people knew, to wear two pairs of pants and don't let him take any off. She let him take one off, which is kind of nuts. But in any case, so Zelda Perkins and, and people who worked for him knew that he was a beast, that it wasn't just having affairs, it was about conquest. And conquest of men, who he yelled at and put down, and conquest of women sexually. Any more questions? I suppose this would take another evening, but how did you develop your wonderful interviewing skills? And if you were to advise somebody um, doing interviews like you have been doing, what would you say? Listen. Be a good listener. Um, don't, you don't need to talk. Let the silence work for you. Ask a question and don't jump in and interrupt them. Let them talk. And and we'll build that confidence, too, that you're not some shark. You, know? you don't go into an initial interview like a dentist. I'm here to drill your teeth. I mean, you, you won't have that person's attention. But listening is, is, I think, a key ingredient of journalists. And one of the reasons why, one of the reasons that concerns me about the nature of journalism, you watch the cable networks, and all these, these pundits are expressing opinions. And they're not listening. They're certain. Who's going to win the election? Let me tell you who's going to win the election. Well, how do you know who's going to win the election? And, and so the humility to listen disappears, and that's, that, I think, is death for good journalism. Right. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, many of us have read about the legendary Hollywood moguls of the 30s, 40s, and 50s and the casting couch and how many of them <laughs> allegedly did, or I mean, there are enough people reporting it, I have to believe it occurred, did really what Weinstein did. Or did they not? That's my question. They how are not. they different? Or how they, is Weinstein different from what they did? Weinstein is different. Uh, the casting couch, which Harvey is his defense, it was casting couch. And the casting couch was quite disgusting, the abuse of power. Louis B. Mayer uh, may well have certainly abused Judy Garland. Um, and, and one of the things, Ilaya Kazan writes a, uh, wrote a brilliant autobiography in which he says, one of the things that the studio, early studio heads believed, and I think they were right, is you don't cast a woman in a role unless you want to sleep with her. He didn't use the word sleep. And that was Harvey's view. And the difference between the old moguls of Hollywood and Harvey is rape was Harvey's M.O. It was the M.O was not the M.O. of many of these men. I'm not saying some of them may not have raped, but we're not aware of, uh, of rape in the same way. They abused women, and it was disgusting. But Harvey, I mean, you're talking about physical assault that he was doing. He was holding down women. He was really, you know, Annabelle Sciorra, you listen to her description of what he did with her at the trial. I mean, it's unbelievable. I mean, that, or Rowena, what he did with Rowena, same thing. It, it's, and, 
I don't think the Louis V. Mayers and the and the other moguls were did not. First of all, they weren't as big as Harvey to be able to do that. <laughs> Well, part of the reason I asked the question is I just watched a rerun of the old movie, How to Succeed in Business Without Really That's Trying. pretty good, isn't Which it? is a great movie. It's yeah. my high school musical. And, but there's a scene in there where one of the executives is chasing his secretary around. And they play it for laughs. Um, and at the time, I'm sure it was funny. But you look at it through a modern lens, and it's disgusting. And the woman's kind of laughing as she does it and such. And I, I'm certainly not excusing what Weinstein did, not excusing what Louis B. Mayer did. Um, and there's a lot we don't know about what they did. But it seems like what Weinstein did was maybe it was more, but it was a continuation of something that had been going on for decades in Hollywood. But there's a difference. I, I, it was going on for decades, but I would argue there's a difference between chasing a woman around the couch, which is sexual harassment, mm -hmm. and rape. Rape is a criminal offense. Of course. Which is why he's, which is why he's in prison. And, and I, I, I just think he was so extreme in what no, he did. I understand. Did. In the movie, though, they didn't catch her. Yeah. You, you don't, they didn't show yeah. what happened if yeah. they did. Right. Thank you. Thank you. This was fun. Copies of Hollywood Ending are available at the checkout desk. Uh, Ken will be up here signing. Please form a line to the right of the table and uh, fold up your chairs uh, to help our staff.